Hello YouTube, Dave here again. I recently got the opportunity to finally run my first D&D Adventures League adventure. Uh, it was a lot of fun, uh, the players that I had were great, the turnout wasn't quite what I was hoping for, uh, but I think there's really nowhere for it to go but up from there. Uh, and I really, like I said, I really enjoyed the experience, but it kind of got me thinking, uh, because there's a lot of people that may not really know what to expect when it comes to uh, D&D Adventures League or organized play in general. So I want to make a video that's sort of like, I guess, a beginner's guide. Uh, it's not going to go into like details of like later level stuff. It's just kind of uh, getting started, things to expect before you show up for your very first session. Uh, the main reason that I wanted to actually make this video is after I did my review of the adventure Murder in Baldur's Gate, uh, I did a search uh, on YouTube just to see if there were other reviews for it, uh, to see what other people had to say about the adventures. And the only thing I actually found was a 50 minute long video uh, with it was three guys at a table and they had a fourth person joining on a laptop and it was a it was a 50 minute rant about how much they hated uh, the adventure which I found really odd because I thought it was one of uh, the more interestingly designed adventures that I've ever really read so I gave the video a watch or at least I tried to I'm gonna be honest I didn't make it all the way through to the end I just couldn't really stand listening to too much more uh, the person in the center of the table was the Dungeon Master. He was the person that was running the adventure. To his left and right were both individuals who were players. And the fourth person joining that was doing it on the computer uh, hadn't played the adventure at all and knew nothing about it, so really that person probably shouldn't have been there because they spent uh, their time on the video just providing generalizations and making assumptions that just, you know, again, if you don't have any experience with it, maybe just kind of leave it alone type of thing. But anyway, uh, the DM said he absolutely hated it and said he was going to burn the stuff uh, after the video was over. I don't think he actually ended up doing that because um, there was a follow-up video that, again, I tried to watch, but it was pretty painful. Um, but one of the things that he said is that he hated the way the adventure was structured because uh, the DM had to improvise some things or come up with some things that are done uh, in between plot points of the adventure. Uh, he also said it was difficult to get his players to stay uh, focused on the main tasks at hand, but then his players actually bragged about the fact that they don't like to stick to the plots that are presented to them, uh, making jokes about, you know, going off the page or off the rails, and uh, it just really honestly seemed like that those two players, they, again, they were bragging about disrupting the story that was presented to them, and the DM's frustrations um, came from that, yet at the same time the DM was always praising what these players were doing because he said it made stuff interesting while they ignored the actual adventure which had some really cool moments which is again just kind of painful but the thing that really struck me was just that this was an organized play session this was part of the D&D encounter system that was going on that he was running and he's got players bragging on the same video where he's venting his frustrations about how they enjoy disrupting the plot of the stories and going off in their own directions. And again, it was funny because as frustrated as the DM was that he had to improvise things, he was again praising his players for going off script. So I don't quite see how he can be upset with that when he's happy that they did it. Anyway, I don't want to trash this video too much. Um, you know, that's not really my style. But it just, again, it really got me thinking. And uh, just listening to the way that the players spoke, I know I would not want them at my table because they seem like they're disruptive. They seem like individuals who want to uh, make the story revolve around them and do whatever they want to do despite what's being presented to you. So with that in mind, for anyone who hasn't actually taken part in organized play or D&D Adventures or Encounters, sorry, uh, Adventures League, sorry, I'm confusing the two. Uh, if you haven't taken part in D&D Adventures League but you were thinking about it, Hopefully this will give you some information that will make it helpful. So, starting off, the number one thing you need to know about D&D Adventures League is that it's all based around pre-written adventures. And it's usually done in a two to four hour time slot. Meaning that the DM really is responsible for trying to keep the players on track. And as a player, it's your responsibility if you're going to go to one of these organized events to go along with the story that's being presented to you. If you don't like the story, that's fine. Don't show up for the next session of it or find another group, uh, maybe even at the same location that's playing a different adventure. But don't actively disrupt the story that's going on because you don't enjoy it. The fact of the matter is, is that these have to be done within certain constraints. 
they have to be done within certain guidelines, and the best way to do it is by having pre-designed adventures. So if you're the kind of player who likes to go off script, likes to go off the rails, you know, likes to go explore what's over the mountains instead of following the trail ahead of them, then you probably won't enjoy your experiences at a D&D &D Adventurers League adventure. Just for those reasons alone, you're kind of, you have to, as a player, realize that you need to follow the plot that's put in front of you. Uh, for example, I ran, uh, started to run, I haven't finished it yet, but I started running um, T uh, Tales from the Yawning Portal, uh, The Sunless Citadel. And I decided to, instead of saying the player characters start at the Citadel or they start in Oakhurst already accepting the mission, I didn't want to role play things out a little bit. So I had a stranger come up to them in the tavern. I thought he was kind of an interesting NPC that I designed who's like this kind of failing alchemist um, who wanted to get the apple that can restore health and cure disease. So he approached the player characters and the player characters kind of wanted something more out of it. So they bartered a little bit but ultimately they realized that they kind of have to follow the adventure that's presented to them. So they ended up taking you know the quest and going on and stuff like that. So uh, first thing is if you don't like pre-running or playing pre-written adventures you don't like having things kind of more, um, I don't want to say railroaded, but having a more specific plot thread that you kind of, that the player characters sort of need to adhere to, then don't, then don't go to D&D Adventures League because it's just not going to be for you. Uh, the next thing is, uh, you know, the, the levels of experience. If you're an experienced player going to an organized event, you have to realize that not everyone that's showing up is necessarily a veteran player. There's going to be, I'd say, especially with 5th edition being popular and bringing a lot of new people in, there's going to be some players that are rookies or noobs or novices, whatever term you want to use. Just be, again, respectful about it. But these are going to be people who want to get into the hobby, they're interested, and this is a great way for them to kind of, you know, get their feet wet, so to speak. If you're an experienced player and you have uh, inexperienced players at your tables, don't get frustrated at them if they ask what you would consider to be silly questions. Don't get frustrated with them if they initially try to do something that is a bad idea. You know, you can try to talk them out of it, but don't talk down to them. One of the things you have to be is really respectful. And again, if you're a veteran player at an organized event, you're kind of representing the brand. You're representing the hobby, and you're representing what gamers should be. So again, just be patient, be polite, and try to help inexperienced players so that they can get to a point where they have the experience and won't kind of make the issues or have the questions, but you know, help them through that period. Oh, the next thing I want to talk about is character creation. So character creation is done from the player's handbook and players can also choose one additional supplement that they can draw information from, but it has to be official. So the things that are you're limited to are the player's handbook, Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide, Volo's Guide to Monsters, and right now the last thing that you can kind of draw from is the Elemental Evil Player's Companion. Uh, that said though, the Aarakocra race, the, the bird race, I don't think would be legal because right now uh, first level characters that have the ability to fly are not legal in D&D Adventurers League. So it is a bit more restricted as to what your options are. But again, you can make out of the player's handbook, you can select one other resource that you can use uh, for that character and you go through and you make your character. Ability scores are determined by either the standard array or the point by system. The caveat of the point by system is that the maximum uh, ability score that you can have before racial modifiers is 15. So you can't buy yourself up to an 18, 16, or 17. 15 is kind of the highest that you can go through. Again, there is a standard array and your racial uh, modifiers will affect that as well. So if you choose a race that complements the prerequisite ability score for your class, then you're going to be fine. For example, if you make a Dwarf Cleric, um, you can have him get the plus one, or you, you play the, uh, the sub-race that has a plus one Wisdom, put your 15 in Wisdom, it turns into a 16. And that's not bad for a first level character. So your character is going to be a little bit weaker. Uh, you also have to use the fixed hit points when you do level up. So it's whatever it's presented in the player's handbook. So for example, uh, clerics, I think, get five hit points at every level. Um, the uh, fighters, uh, classes like that, get six. I want to say the barbarian gets a seven and like three, four, um, th uh, three or four for the rogues, wizards, and stuff like that. Or, sorry, wizards and uh, sorcerers. 
So anyway, again, keep in mind that you know your stuff is going to be uh, predetermined. It's going to be fixed. You're not going to have the ability to roll for hit points. So you, if you're someone who's used to being able to roll for hit points, having high stats and high hit points, um, this again may not be the best experience for you. Now the idea and the reasoning behind all of this, to have the same kind of array of ability scores, to use the fixed hit points and the uh, fixed equipment options that are presented by your class and background. Again, another important thing, you can't buy your equipment. You have to use what's there for uh, your class, which gives you like A and B options for the most part, and the stuff that comes with your background. But the reason that this is done is, is to put everybody on equal footing, meaning that um, nobody's going to have an advantage or a more powerful character than anybody else going to these events. And again, the idea is that you can take these characters to any D&D uh, &D Adventurers League event. You don't have to keep using the same DM. If you find a group uh, that's closer to you, uh, or another group that plays on a different day and you want to go there, if your character fits the, the level range that they have, then by all means, you know, you can take your character there and you can actually play through. Uh, the adventures that are presented. So it's just kind of done to, again, put everybody on that level playing field. Uh, the last things that I really want to talk about are uh, treasures and character death, because these are the other things to keep in mind, uh, as well as some other options that you have in the early levels. So the first thing is talking about treasure, talking about magic items, things like that. So at the end of each session or adventure, uh, depending on how the DM wants to do it, um, you divvy up whatever gold and items were found at that point in time. So gold is split evenly amongst all the players present, and magic items can be determined by the groups if they work things out on their own. So if they decide that you know the fighter gets the magical sword that was found, and the wizard gets you know the 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 wand, then that's fine. Uh, if the two, if there are two players or more that are interested in the same number or the same item, and they can't come to an agreement, there's ways to arbitrate it. So one of the things you have to keep track of on this tracker sheet that has like the adventures, the XP that you started with, how much you earned, um, what you ended with, gold that you earned, and stuff like that, as well as magic items, you have to keep track of your number of permanent magic items. So consumable or non-consumable, I guess is what they refer to them as. Consumable items are things that are used, one letter spent once they're actually used. So potions are consumables, uh, scrolls are consumables, and magical ammunition is considered to be uh, a consumable item because once you fire that plus one arrow, it's gone. You don't get it back. So those don't factor in as much, but what does matter is the number of non-consumable items that you have. So magic rings, amulets, rods, staffs, wands, suits of armor, weapons, um, ion stones, things along those lines that you find uh, can dictate whether or not you're able to get items if there's a clash between people that want them. So in the event that, say, two people both want the same magical suit of armor and neither of them can come to an agreement, then it goes automatically to the player with the fewer number of permanent or, or non-consumable magic items. So if that's, you know, if so, whoever has the least will get it. In the event that they're both tied for the number of uh, non-consumable items, then it's up to the DM to arbitrate. And I will say personally, if I'm the one doing it, I'm going to roll it randomly to determine who ends up getting it. So when it comes to divvying up magic items, try to work stuff out amongst yourselves. Uh, in between sessions, I believe you can trade non-consumable items with other, uh, with other players. And I think you can even do so within uh, your own characters, because you can have multiple characters in multiple games. Uh, so that's another thing to keep in mind, but you do have to, I think, submit uh, information about when you did the trade, and both players have to, you know, sort of do that sort of thing. And if you trade items, you have to trade for a similar item of like rarity. So, for example, you have, like, uh, uncommon magic items, common, uh, and then I think rare and very rare. So if you trade a very rare item to somebody, you have to get a very rare item in exchange. They don't have to be like a weapon for a weapon or armor for armor, but they have to be of the same rarity if you're going to do trades. Uh, now another options and things that you can do uh, when you first start D&D Adventurers League is their initial or lowest tier of play, which I think levels 1 through 4, and I think it goes like 5 through 8, and there's a few different like tiers of play that you can go through. And you can't take uh, characters into adventure tiers that are too high or too low a level for them. Uh, but anyway, in the beginning, the first four levels of play, you have the option in between sessions 
to redo your character. You keep the same character name because you're still following the, the same progression. You, I think you keep all the same items except your starting equipment. So anything that you had that was left over from your starting gear, uh, that disappears. But you can change your class. Uh, I think you can even go so far as to change your race. Uh, change like your your builds and stuff like that. So if you even if you you're playing a wizard and you don't like the spells that you selected at first level, uh, you can change that stuff. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Now once you get beyond fourth level, once you make your character up to fifth level, and once you play your first fifth level adventure, uh, you can no longer change your character. So you know you have the first few levels to kind of play around with a few different ideas. If you're not quite sure what you want to play, and let's just say you make a fighter but you're not having a lot of fun with it, in between adventures you can redesign it, make it into a rogue, cleric, wizard, whatever. But once you reach fifth level, you're locked in. Uh, another thing to talk about, and the last thing I want to touch on, is character death. So in the event that your character dies, uh, the, what you need to do is find some sort of way to get them raised, resurrected, reincarnated, anything along those lines, uh, in order to keep your character, essentially. So if you do that, then that's fine. You, there's a table for spellcasting services. Uh, now, if your level's one through four, and you can't afford to have your character raised, uh, but you still want to play that character, then if you're part of a faction, uh, the faction that you've joined can uh, arrange to have you raised from the dead. There are consequences to having them do that, however. So, for example, you lose the experience points you've earned up to that point uh, for the session. Uh, you also have a negative four penalty to things like attack rolls, uh, skill checks and ability checks, I believe. And uh, the only way to get rid of that is to take some long rests, being eight hour rests. Each eight hour rest that you take uh, removes uh, a negative one from that penalty. So it goes to negative three, negative two, negative one, and then you're back to normal. <laughs> so that's definitely an option as well. Uh, the, you know, your factions will not do this once you reach fifth level as well. So levels one through four are kind of like the training wheel section uh, of, of D&D Adventures League. So you can make changes. If your character dies, you can have them brought back uh, without cost to you. Uh, just some other types of you know, penalties that, uh, that occur. Now, if you're playing a higher level character, and your character dies and you decide not to get them raised or the party even if they pull all their resources together can't afford to get you raised the unfortunate thing is you have to start over with a brand new level one character and level them up through the various tiers so that's something to keep in mind if you are playing a higher level uh, characters uh, you got to be a little bit more cautious and try to hold on to some money that way if you die you can get yourself uh, resurrected so anyway Again, I just wanted to give some, just some early stuff to know uh, about D&D Adventures League. I guess one last point that I really should make is uh, what you should have when you show up for your first session. Um, it's best if you have your own set of dice. Now, you don't necessarily need to have your own set of dice. They are available if you're, if you're running through a store. The store should have some sets of dice that you can purchase. Um, so if you don't have one but you want to get your own set, you can get them there at the time. Uh, a lot of DMs uh, will, especially if you're running organized events as a DM, you should have extra set of dice or sex, sets of dice uh, to accommodate anyone who may show up and doesn't have their own. Some people just simply can't afford the 12 to 13 dollars that most of these sets of dice are these days, uh, Canadian dollars. Uh, so that's kind of important. Uh, have you know, try to have your own pencil. Uh, again, DMs, if you're running events at stores or businesses. Uh, or organizing these events, you should try to have extra pencils if people need them. But as a player, it's great if you can bring your own writing instruments, uh, your own erasers, and if you have the ability to print off your own character sheets as well, uh, that can help out quite a bit, uh, since it can start to cost money for ink and paper and stuff like that. So like for my, for my first experiences, I printed off character sheets for everybody uh, that I was expecting to show up. So I printed those off myself, but I think in the future, uh, I would expect players to, uh, especially if they've been there for a few sessions, find a way to create or bring their own uh, sheets to the, to the table. Uh, now, as far as the player's handbook goes, it's not necessary uh, for Adventurers League. You can use the free basic rules, uh, but if you're really interested in it and you're really you know, committing yourself to being part of Adventurers League, especially if it's being run at a store, try to buy a player's handbook at the store. Uh, I know it can be kind of expensive, 
but if you think you're going to be showing up for regular sessions like every week, every two weeks, or even once a month for the entire year, like for four hour sessions, gaming sessions, at a store, especially if they're not charging cover fees, pick up a player's handbook, you know, support the business. Anyway, that's pretty much this, the grounds that I wanted to cover. Uh, I hope you found the video helpful if you're interested in Adventures League but not quite sure yet. Um, again, you know, I felt the need to kind of make this. The, the main thing I really wanted to say was the early stuff about it being pre-written adventures and you have to just accept that that's what's going to happen. Anyway, thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and we'll see you next time.